Hello. Rarely has a more placid organisation been subjected over the years to such persecution. In fact, the state of Massachusetts once passed a law sanctioning the lopping off of Quakers' ears. This was a rather alarming reaction to a group of people who pride themselves on tolerance and laissez-faire. Tonight, the Quakers. <laughs> I'm Alistair Lomax and I've been a Quaker for 15 years. I write and travel among friends and I try and promote an understanding of the faith of the early Quakers. My name is Andrew Greaves. I was born and brought up in a Quaker family. During the 1980s, I helped to set up a Quaker community at Bamford in Derbyshire. My name is Joyce Trotman. I'm not English. I'm Guyanese. I am a Christian, and when I came to England, I became a Quaker. My name's Frank Parkinson, and I think I would call myself a free-range Christian. I believe that all the great religions of the world have the same spiritual truths at their deepest level, and I think that science can help us to get down to those levels. My name is Harvey Gilman. I became a member of the Quakers about 20 years ago from a working class Jewish family. I became a Quaker because I wanted to follow my spiritual journey as a full human being. I'm Lisa Shendge. When I went to my first Quaker meeting about nine years ago, I immediately felt that I'd come home. And the more I found out, the more I became convinced that this was where I was meant to be. Now, I know that silence is a very big part of, of, of what you do, and I know you wanted a little bit of silence to start the programme with. I think the silence has actually started now. So, <clears throat> so what actually occurs in, in that silence? What occurred in that silence? I think I sensed a real gatheredness in this little group just then. I think you know, the presence of God was truly with us. I think, for me, that's what happened. Do you all agree with that? Yeah, we come together to commune with God and to commune with one another. I think all our meetings, and we have a whole variety of meetings, are all the same as what we've just been doing. Some last a couple of minutes, some last very much longer. And we meet together in the hope that God will come to us and speak through one of us if that happens. And how do you know when that's happening? I think that's one of the origins of the word Quaker. Um, I mean, it, it hits everybody differently. I always feel as if someone's just booted me out of my chair. And so it's an, it's an actual feeling, it's a, a it, literal yeah. feeling. It's a, it's a very powerful it's a feeling. feeling. It's a, it's a, yeah. You can do no other. Yes. And you find yourself on your feet before you know that you're there. Mm. <coughs> yes. um, shall I read a little bit from Quaker Faith and Practice to tell us what we do in our meeting? 
Yeah. Please this do. is our book of discipline, and in in worship, we enter with reverence into communion with God and respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Come to meeting for worship with heart and mind prepared. Yield yourself and all your outward concerns to God's guidance, so that you may find the evil weakening in you and the good raised up. We seek a gathered stillness in our meetings for worship, so that all may feel the power of God's love drawing us together and leading us. So the silence breaks when somebody is compelled to talk? Um, I don't think I like the word break. Mm. Because when somebody gets up to minister, it is something that comes out of the silence. Mm -hmm. And goes back into it. Yeah. And yeah. goes back into it. That's yeah. the important thing. I mean, for example, um, if a meeting lasts about an hour, which is a fairly standard sort of time for a meeting to last, you could probably expect the first ministry after about 20, 25 minutes. I, having said that, it doesn't always go like that, but that would be a fairly typical pattern. Um, but I think what's important about ministry is that if it doesn't feel right for you when you're listening to it, you don't need to listen to it. And it's quite astonishing. I mean, I've had the experience of sitting in meeting not really thinking about anything in particular, being on my feet, coming out with some words and sitting down again. And afterwards, two different friends came up to me and said, thank you for that, that was exactly what I needed. And because I didn't remember what I'd said, I said, what did I say? And each one told me something quite different. <laughs> and a third friend who was listening said, actually, you didn't say either of those things. <laughs> so they had heard what they needed to hear. And that, that's very reassuring, actually. <laughs> But it's not uncommon also mm. for um, somebody to stand up and, and say something and, and for another person to say, that's exactly what yes. I was going to say. Mm -hmm. yes. And in another setting, that might be found to be evidence of uh, extrasensory perception or something. <laughs> but, but friends are quite yes. used to that sort yeah. of mm -hmm. um, yes. sympathetic... Yes. Mm. It, it, it's yes. sort of link, it's a sort of unseen link that somehow you have, you, you're sorting some, something out in your own mind has happened to me recently, and I'm waiting for an opening. And when I'm not expecting it, somebody ministers. And I say, but my goodness, that's it. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's almost listening to the voice of God within, yeah. the light within. Mm. And I suppose when you are forced to speak, in a sense, you are articulating that inner voice. So it yeah. deepens the silence rather than acts as an opposition to the silence. Mm. Mm. Now, notice your, your calling yourselves friends and, and, you know, obviously from the Society of Friends. And the term Quaker was, was originally a, a derogatory term, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was a nickname. Yeah. Right, yeah. mm. um, and um, now it's not. I, I take it now it's not. Mm. It's, it, it isn't. Now it's it's an obscure term to many people. It <laughs> is, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, George Fox, who was the founder of the Society, actually didn't like the word Quaker. But they, they often describe themselves the the people have gone in scorn called Quakers. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a popular term to friends in the 17th century, but mm -hmm. with common usage it just simply stuck. And, right. yes. and you were called Quakers, obviously, because of the, the, the quaking. Mm -hmm. The quaking. Mm -hmm. I can see why it was a derogatory, considered a derogatory mm -hmm. term. It was taking just one manifestation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of like calling mm -hmm. Jews the shantas. But I think we use, we use the terms the term interchange. Of originally. Indeed. Was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A derogatory <laughs> nickname, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Christian. Yeah, first <laughs> Antioch, I think. Yeah. Mm. If I remember my Bible well. Yeah. Yes. And this has, um, this, this has an allusion to something I said in the introduction about early persecution, which is mm. something which I don't think many people, certainly not something I knew about, about, about the society that... Oh, yes. Well, um, why was there so A great so deal of persecution. Mm. Well, well, I, I was, I was <laughs> going to say that, that essentially, um, we're here as reasonably decent people, <laughs> um, reasonably <laughs> so. Um, but in fact, in the early days, Quakers were regarded as extreme subversive. They were turning the world upside revolution. down. Mm. <laughs> I, I think if you if you if you take the basic idea that there is something divine within each 
human being, then you don't need the mediation of a priesthood. And therefore, you are threatening the power structures of the established the church. church. Yeah. Moreover, if you are saying that there is that of God, which is the phrase, in every human being, then you are threatening class distinctions. And the way Quakers used to speak in the theeing and vowing and refusing to take <laughs> off their hats hat, yeah. <laughs> to superiors meant that they were the equivalent, I would say the equivalent in the 1640s, 50s and 60s, to what communists were in the post-war America. Mm. They were the, the mm. dangerous reds mm. under yeah, the beds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hence, anyone with any power, afraid of losing their power over the people, would be would begin to persecute you and, and, and friends it, it, ended up in it prison. Was, it was also political because this yes. is where politics and religion were one and the same. Parliament were, the members of parliament were all either Presbyterians or Calvinists or what have you. So that even when James Naylor came up against them, parliament was sitting to find out what to do with James Naylor. Could you mm. imagine? Mm -hmm. So that if you didn't, if you, and, and the one thing, if they didn't catch you on anything else, if you refuse to swear allegiance, mm. they always got them on that. Yes. Because they said, let your yea be nay, let your nay be nay. They wouldn't swear. Mm. And so they would try every other tack, and you, and you, you, you know, they get you on that one. Mm. And now, you who was have James Naylor? Combat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He was one of the early great charismatic early figures. He was a character. Yeah. Really. He, he was in he fact... He rode into, rode into Bristol on a donkey. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 But this, this is... This is, this is yeah. mm. Go on. As Joyce yeah. said, he rode, he rode into Bristol and, and uh, some very enthusiastic followers threw their garments and branches in front of the horse and made it look like the appearance of Christ into Jerusalem. And he was instantly arrested and arraigned with blasphemy. And yeah, under, the blasphemy uh, under the blasphemy act, you yeah. see. So, and they caught him there. It was even tried directly by Parliament mm. uh, itself. I think the last person to be so tried, I think. Yeah. And in the end, he had his uh, and, and, tongue and board through. But I think, I mean, Quakers were stigmatised. In many ways, uh, they were considered to be the Jews of the Christian world because of all sorts of reasons, mainly because they wouldn't swear oaths, they couldn't go to university, they couldn't join the army. Well, that was probably just as well because they probably wouldn't have wanted to. But there were all sorts of things they were unable to do. So a lot of them went into commerce, and you have this, this vision of the, the rich Quaker merchant. Well, Andrews, yes. your, your, your father was, was in prison for that's what right. you could interpret as being his, his Quaker beliefs. Mm. Well, he was a conscientious objector, that's right, yeah. Mm. What happened? Um, well, he was. Some conscientious objectors were um, were given leave to do something else, and some were, I think, unconditional conscientious objectors, if I understand it correctly. And um, he opted to um, spend time in Wormwood Scrubs rather than do anything which he considered might be a compromise with his stand against the war. Um, and in fact, in the First World War, my grandfather began um, on the Western Front as an, an ambulance worker in, in the Friends Ambulance Unit. Because although Quakers weren't involved in the fighting directly, they did um, have an important support role in, in trying to look after the wounded and injured. But um, after being decorated for gallantry, um, he decided that he, he must come back and face a tribunal because even being involved to that extent was more than his conscience would allow. And um, he, he spent until well after the end of um, hostilities in solitary confinement in prison for that. Um, my own, my father actually, after his time in, in, in prison, um, ended up working with down and outs under Charing Cross Railway Bridge um, in a club which um, you know, he felt was allowed to him as a form of service instead. Well, can you, can you talk me through the, the, the meeting for worship? Because it, how, the decision-making process seems quite extraordinary to me. Can I just say, every meeting that we have is a meeting for worship. We're, we're, we're very simple people in that we have a single standard, so everything ideally is worship. Every meeting right, is I a meeting for worship. Yeah. Could you ask him? Sometimes we have a meeting for worship for business. Mm. 
and the practicalities. I'll ask him something. Mm -hmm. Sorry, really. Come on, Frank, chip in. So are you telling me that when you have your silent meeting, so I should just somebody say, come on? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, we, we, I should say three out of our uh, four in meetings in our meeting in, in Blackpool are silent. Entirely uh, silent? Yes. And then you just... Uh, go home at the end of it. <laughs> uh, well, you have a cup of tea first. <laughs> um, but you never know when it's going to, when the meeting is going to gather, or and maybe you go home sometimes and you just sort of feel well, it, it, it hasn't been a particularly good meeting. But if somebody says why not, then it's very difficult to put it into words. And your worship and your witnesses, in part, mm. turning up. And, and participating with mm, others yes. present. And, yeah. and yeah. But, but silence is worship, yeah. and so is speaking. And sometimes well, it's actually sure that the, 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 the amount of silence in a meeting shouldn't determine whether it was a good meeting or not. No. Oh, no. no. Uh, yeah. it, it's, um, it's something that sometimes everybody feels, uh, and, and it, it's very unplannable. I can remember at a a yearly meeting when we were at a side meeting at nine o'clock in the evening and the janitor at the hall which was at Warwick University said well I've got to lock up and uh, they brought the meeting to a close very suddenly and then the whoever was clerking it said well can we have a little silence and I thought this was a little bit of formality but we were only silent for about two minutes and I could only explain it as falling into a pit of something uh, and then it was all over and you've just come out wondering what actually happened can you explain that more well uh, no not really it's just that suddenly it, you're silent in a normal sort of way as as one might be in any occasion and then suddenly you seem to go down to a depth of you centered of, down of, <laughs> you, yes well it's, they say centered down but you yes. seem to reach a level of being and i think it it, it to, to me, as um, uh, it, it seems to touch the deepest parts, the, the highest parts of the brain, and the deepest parts. And, and if I may give a little instance, last Sunday we had a uh, what seemed to be a, a, a very deeply gathered meeting, for no obvious reason. But the sense of reality that I had was so acute that I. I felt rather embarrassed because I felt the tears trickling down my <laughs> face and, yes. and I happened to have my car keys in my pocket where my handkerchief was so <laughs> every ten minutes there was a little rattle <laughs> I pulled my handkerchief out. Um, but I, nothing was said about it and uh, I don't think anything was said after the meeting. Um, and, uh, but having experienced it, one is aware that one has experienced something that one hasn't found anywhere else before. And, and, and there's mm. not a word really, I don't think mm. there's any word yet that has been coined to really explain it and maybe it's, it's just as well to leave it like that because the word would limit it. Yes. Yes. There is a living mm. silence. I, th I think the point is we tend to think of communication as words mm. and you can communicate at a very profound level in silence through a sense of the existence of the other, like, like two people who are in love. Yes. Mm. You know, you, you, there's a wonderful way. In fact, the more you're in love, I mean, there are the cliches, I love you, I love you. But then there's the reality of two human beings together who are communicating at a profound level without anything being said. Without without anything being said. said. Mm. Mm. And there's a shallow silence, just like there's a shallow relationship. And words can be powerful and words can be superficial. So it's breaking down the difference between silence and words. Mm. And the real criterion is, is it living mm. or is it not living? Are there ever awkward silences at meetings? <laughs> oh, yes. I think yes. you get yes, an yes, awkward so. silence if somebody... I, I think we, we need to explain this thing that, we, that we're talking about called ministry. Yes. Mm. yes. Um, because there is no priest and there is no sermon. I think this is what made me become a Quaker. I just got tired of somebody at a, up in a pulpit <laughs> <laughs> talking telling down at me do. and <laughs> telling me, you know, yeah. what happened last week to him and his girlfriend or that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and when I had had enough of that. <laughs> and so I was so happy to be among people where the, 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 the ministry was coming from somewhere else. 
and as you say, it comes out of the silence, and it could be an experience you have had, or you read something from the Bible, or you see something in the Bible in a new way, something in which George, George, George Fox will call an opening. You see, you've been living with this, this bit of scripture for so long, and then it suddenly acquires another significance. So this is ministry. But then you've got sometimes somebody comes in very overwrought, very worked out, and you can get awkward ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you get that, then the silence that follows it could be awkward. Mm -hmm. And this is where if we have committees, we don't have a pastor, but you have a committee of elders, and elders are, have the remit of seeing to the right ordering of the meeting. And very often, this is where elders will come in, either have a word with the person afterwards, or even to quietly ask him to cut short his ministry or us. Mm. And something like that would happen. But, you know, because but you know, somebody <coughs> comes straight off the road and he harangued us for about mm. five minutes and we didn't <laughs> know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one shouldn't be judgmental, though, because there are times where out of the silence, I mean, one is quite exposed in the silence. Mm. Mm. So you find things about yourself which... You've got to be you, very brave you have, sometimes. Yes. Um, <laughs> And I, I've been to a meeting for worship. I remember one where somebody just wept, mm. wrote down and wept. I mm. regarded that as his ministry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. That oh, yeah. was yeah. as full of power as anything in his mm. life and mm. communicated to us. And we weren't awkward about that. No, uh, someone no. went up to him and embraced him mm. and held him for the meeting. And, and that was wonderful ministry. I mean, well, that, that really is living, you, you, living you, you, in you, the life. Yeah, because here he was giving you, a, making you a gift of his own vulnerability. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. And, and, and that yeah. can happen because this is what being part of one another is supposed to be. Yes. And if silence follows that, that, I mean, often it's, you could get an embarrassed withdrawal of support from that person so they seem isolated in the center. But yeah. what often happens where there's strong emotion felt that you were saying yeah, Frank is yeah. that there's a, a drawing together you and the silence is closed. deeper yes, and yes. and the meeting follows on and goes yeah. to a much deeper place yeah, as a result where, this of this. This is where one man talked and he says and, and we were gathered as in a net. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the relationship between the people present reaches a totally different level mm. and that spills out into your the rest of your life and I think that's the other thing is that and I know every religion can and should claim this, you know, we're not just Quakers on Sundays. Um, and when you have the opportunity at Meeting for Worship, and sometimes it really is uh, the most exciting time, silence isn't the absence of words, it's the opportunity for the presence of something else, for the awareness of that presence. Mm -hmm. And it can be really, as I say, incredibly exciting, joyous, moving, and yes, people do cry. Mm -hmm. Does an, an enjoyment of silence, does that make you better listeners, do you think? <laughs> I was no. just going to say that. I think I it does. I wish it did. Especially <laughs> for someone like me who tends no. to be quite impetuous. Um, I realised how bad a listener I was. I have to be a Quaker. Yeah. I really have to be yeah. a Quaker. <laughs> it's a wonderful discipline. I can relate to that. <laughs> Listen, yeah. Um, it, because it makes you hear people. If, yeah. if you listen to conversations on the bus, you know, people are talking this way. They're, they're not actually listening to each other. And very often they're not even hearing each other so that they will go on as though they've understood, but you know that they haven't heard what the other person yeah. is saying. Yeah. There the are assumptions going on all the time. Now, I think at its best, and we are human beings with all the failings of humanity, but there is this sense of being able to be aware of the presence of the other, to take in the presence of the other. You're you in don't the presence need to of God. You know, you're, yes. you're in the presence of a child of God. So That's you pay right. him a yes. lot of attention. There's that yes. of God in him, and he deserves your attention. That's right. Mm. Yes. So it's not mm. just because it's one human being. It's where you're coming from. Yes. And it's the ability to see what lies behind the words. Mm. Yes. See where the words yes. come from. Mm. Yes. 
Yes. I, I once read in, in a book about Quakers that it was some instructions which you never get about what to do in silent meeting. Uh. You're just supposed to sit there and it, it all happens, which I think is a gap, to be quite honestly, in oh, somebody training. Just, I'm, just, I'm going to share with you an article somebody has just written about what happens in the silence and suggestions for what you can do. Well, this one suggestion <laughs> stuck in my mind. It said, look at everybody in the meeting mm. and the people that you simply cannot get on with normally, mm. look at them twice. <laughs> 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 and, and I think this is the discipline yes. that Harvey was talking yeah. about. And, and over a long period, it, it, it works. It works uh, because, yeah. because behind that is a child, it's, it's that yeah. of God. Yeah. It's another, yeah. you know, it's God. I, I mean, still in that book, um, I mean, we, when people say, what do Quakers believe? It's a very difficult question because you've got three Quakers, you'll have three sets of yeah. belief. Um, but we do believe for example, that each human being is, is unique? unique, precious, a child of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't just mean Quakers. Everybody. And yeah. it can be exciting. I mean, I remember when I first went to meeting, I didn't know what everyone else was doing, so I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. So I did what I'd always done when I'd gone to church or other places, and it seemed to work, and I still do it. Um, but now sometimes what I do is I sit and I I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I look around the meeting and I just thank God for the fact that I'm, I'm there, that I'm allowed mm -hmm. to be there yeah. with this, these people whom I love the, 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 and who love me. I think the best, the, the best, the best um, example is from Alexander Parker. Shall I read it? <laughs> Go on, George. Alexander Parker. Who was He's going lovely. to say no? <laughs> <laughs> this is Alexander Parker writing in 1660. <laughs> And I always do, I do, I go into meeting very early because this is the bit I like to have for myself. <laughs> the first that enters into the place of your meeting, turn in thy mind to the light and wait upon God singly as if none were present but the Lord. And here thou art strong. So you get in there first. <laughs> <laughs> then the next that comes in, let him in simplicity of heart sit down and turn in the same light and wait in the spirit. And so all the rest coming in, in the fear of the Lord, sit down in pure stillness and silence of flesh and wait in the light. Mm -hmm. Those who are brought to a pure, still waiting upon God in the spirit are come nearer to the Lord than words are. For God is a spirit, and in spirit is he worshipped. In such a meeting, there will be an unwillingness to part asunder, mm -hmm. being ready to say in yourselves, it is good to be here. And this is the end of all words and writings, to bring people to the eternal living word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Can I just, yeah. just exactly. have a point about worship that I really wanted to make? Um, uh, first of all, I've come to the conclusion now, after a few years of being a Quaker, is, is worship is not something we do. Oh. It's an event to which we respond to as human beings. Yeah. It's, it's our response to the presence of the living God in our mm. midst. Mm. You know, mm. and I've tried all sorts of techniques and they've failed. You know, it, it just happens. You know, we gather together and in the hope yeah. that a promise will be fulfilled. And Jesus says, wherever two or three are, are gathered together in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them. And, and we just gather in, in the hope and trust that he will fulfill that promise for us. And, um, you know, it's something that happens to us. You know, God, God is present and he, he touches us with his spirit and we respond to that. Mm. And, you know, I, I can't make it happen. You know, it's not a method or a technique. And we, we can prepare ourselves for that, mm. for that experience, I think. You know, coming with heart and mind prepared. But the technique but, is actually there in the Old Testament. Be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. That's the technique. Yeah. That's what we do, or yeah, we try to do. We try to and be still, waiting, and then we know that life. he is God. Yeah. Yeah. Does there have to yeah. be a quorum? No. 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 Two or three. Two or three. No. There has been just a dog. You can do it on your own. Yes, yes. There's a story of a <laughs> an old man. Where is it? Brig Flats? Brig Flats. Brig Flats meeting. 
wherever, but um, this, this guy used to come with his dog faithfully, <laughs> week after week. After all, you just need the Holy Spirit, you don't need many people. And we're very small, so it's a very good uh, excuse for us. You know, the Holy Spirit is there, and this guy used to go with his dog. And he died, but the dog oh, used to go cool. by itself <laughs> to the <a> meeting. <laughs> and that was the presence. And then someone else noticed the dog going down the lane every day and decided to follow it. And there you are. Another person came to the meeting, yeah. and the meeting, you know, the, the idea yeah, of the at, faithful at, dog. Yeah, mm -hmm. at, 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 a, at the yearly meeting at Aberystwyth, I don't know if you were there, where a lady yes. um, gave her experience. Of the numbers had fallen, so, but she always went, opened the meeting house, put out the cups for coffee and what have you. And while she was doing that one day, on her own, there were tourists, four tourists, just so on the map or wherever, oh, there's a Quaker meeting house, let's go check it out. Mm. Mm. And she had her meeting for worship. <laughs> and wasn't there an occasion, Alistair, when, when you were moved to speak at a meeting for worship and then you realised that you were in the wrong... This is true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, this is actually true, yeah. Well, it was one uh, first day morning. Um, I had a very powerful um, urge to speak. And as I sat there in the meeting, I realised that the people around me weren't the recipients of the message. And in fact, I, I was filled with horror that, that I had to speak to the chapel across the road up the street. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, um, I can't do this. This is, this is, this is really too much. I, I think I must be, I must be on the, drifting into to madness here. Uh, but um, I found myself on my feet and walking out of the the meeting house. And nobody asked you where you were going? Or? Well, uh, uh, the other elder looked at me a bit shocked and later on she thought I'd had a funny turn and, and gone off to lie down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I found myself walking up the street feeling very odd and um, all my neighbours were waving to me saying hello, hello, because I lived two doors up from the meeting house so they all knew me and they wondered what was happening. But you couldn't talk to I them? I couldn't talk to them. And I thought, well, this is, this, is, this is crazy. I don't even know if there's a service going on in this chapel. Anyway, I rounded the corner at the top of the, our street and the chapel doors were open and somebody was preaching. I thought, oh, no, this is, this is, <laughs> this is, this is weird. And I, I actually laid my hand on the latch of the, of the door into the chapel. And I thought, well, I just can't lift this latch. But my hand just lifted it and I walked in. And all, it's not, a, it's, not a big, it's not a big chapel, there's not many people in the congregation, but they all look round at me, and they all knew me. And, you know, they're obviously thinking, you know, what's happening here, what's, what's this person doing? And I sat there, and I, I listened to the sermon. And I, at that time, I had absolutely no idea of what, what I was going to actually say, or why I'd been moved to go up to this chapel. And uh, the, the, the minister um, carried on with this sermon for a while. And I just sat there saying, well, well, Lord, what, why am I here? Why have you brought me here? And nothing was given to me. Uh, at, at the end, he, fi he, finished, he finished his sermon. And one of the congregation turned around and gave me a hymn book. <laughs> and he said, I will now sing hymn number such and such a thing. Um, but I, I suddenly found, found myself on my feet and saying, and, and something was given to me, a voice just said, tell them why you've come and tell them my blessings upon them if they are obedient to what I move them to do. So I got up and I, I said to the minister, I'm sorry, but do you mind if I say something? And he just says, no, carry on. Go ahead. <laughs> I was quite surprised. And um, how long had you been in silence at this point? How long? Must have been about 10, 15 minutes, must have been. And I just got up. And I told them what had happened, that I'd been in meeting for worship down the, down the street, and that I'd been moved to come up to them. And I said that, you know, God, God will bless you if you're obedient to his word as it moves in your heart. Be obedient to it. And everybody's mouths were open, and I just sat down. And they sang, they sang the hymn, and that was the end of the service. And the minister came up to me with tears in his eyes, and he, and he pointed his finger at me and he said, what you have done today will speak far more than any of the words I used in my sermon today. And we just sort of broke down into tears and embraced each other. Mm. And it was a pretty incredible experience, mm. really.
even amongst friends, conflicts. Oh, yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. I know in um, yeah. sort of when we had disagreements or conflicts to resolve in the community, um, mm. we, we obviously have recourse to meeting for worship to, um, mm. to resolve things. And yeah. Yeah. it's really funny how you know, when you sit down in silence opposite the person that you've fallen out with, mm. you know, you say, well, I wasn't entirely being honest when I said that. And, mm. you know, maybe they have got a point and so on. And, and one of the things about be wrong, being, be wrong, being yeah. quiet is mm. that honesty um, mm. comes back into mm. the situation and, and ego, you yeah. know, takes its rightful yeah. place, as yeah. Harvey was yeah. saying. And, and reconciliation becomes possible because oh, yeah. all those things that are so entrenched begin to dissolve yeah. if we just create the space for, for peace the spirit for to, to, to work. work. Now, you spoke about the, the, the cross, the cross um, yeah. and you believe you have to be a, a Christian yeah. um, to be a Quaker. Or is that... Yes, that's true, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's a lot of non-Christian yes. Quakers. Yes, there are. Does that, is that, is that a, a sticking <laughs> point, or are you OK, really, about that? I find it personally difficult. It's a sticking mm -hmm. point for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can understand it, but it's still a sticking point yes, for I, me. Yes, I can understand it. Having been a non-Christian and come from that position, I do empathise very much and have a, a tremendous respect, but it's still difficult because mm. I feel a, a religious society of friends without the presence and the power of Christ is, is a religious society that's that's got that's that's missing the one essential ingredient. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. don't accept that. Um, you used no, to be I a don't. bit different. <laughs> well, you used to you used to be a Benedictine monk, didn't you, Frank? Shortly, yes. Oh <laughs> <laughs> really? mm. uh, yes, I was just uh, just thinking um, uh, what Andrew was saying because I remember the the abbot of this monastery saying that. Uh, uh, a, a monastery, a, a religious house, was like a bag of rough pebbles that were shaken up for a lifetime until they became smooth. <laughs> but uh, looking back on it, um, I wish we had had the silent meeting there, because I think that really is a marvelous instrument for, for, for s resolving these differences. The, the silence is 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 a very for business. If, you see, every meeting is a meeting for worship. If you have a meeting for worship for business and we come to an impasse, the clerk would say, friends, um, let us have some silent worship. Mm. And this is down to the most, the, the tiniest detail, what, what colour to paint the wall. Yeah. yeah. It could, mm, will you talk me through, will you talk, yeah. has anyone actually had a what colour should we paint the wall No, we, we, we had, we had, we had, shall we, should we have, tables or not tables or what kind of chairs we should have or something like that and I remember it, it was quite a thing uh, you know it's one of the things that me you say you remember that meeting we had about the chairs <laughs> um, <laughs> but it resolved itself <laughs> simply because we, we loved one another and even while we were disagreeing we were disagreeing in love this is the important thing. We were not disagreeing because we hated one another. Mm. And, but I think and, that's and a very important statement yeah. because, just to come back to mm. what you were saying about Christianity, um, there is a potential for a great deal of pain among friends. Um, many friends are Christian, would describe themselves as Christian, and many friends are not, would not describe themselves as Christian. And quite a lot of friends are somewhere in the middle. And because we don't have a creed, we don't say, you've got to believe this to be a Quaker. What you actually believe is your business, in a sense. I think what we're perhaps more interested in is what you do about it. Um, and, of course, there are lots of definitions, for example, of Christianity. I mean, Quakerism started at a time when all religions, or all the known religions in England at that time, were really Christian. And so it was a rebellion against Christianity. I mean, I come from a Jewish background. Actually, I come from an atheist background. Um, and I, I don't know what I'd call myself. Uh, I do try to follow the teachings of Jesus and my husband comes from a Hindu background and he's a Quaker and I must say I feel more comfortable with my Jewishness, I feel more Jewish since I became a Quaker. You began talking about the business meetings and yeah. it hasn't probably been, because it's, it is, it's, it's curious what happened so, so you're 
Because I know you, you described a business meeting as um, getting Quakers to come to a decision is like taking a herd of kangaroos for a walk. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't invent that. I heard that at a yearly meeting. Uh -huh. It's very true. Well, the amazing mean, thing is that we that do mean? land up in the right field, usually. Mm. Quakers, by definition, have a tremendous independence. That's a polite way of putting it. Um, in, in common, and I think that it's a, certainly it used to be, and it still is, a very daring way of living. I mean, we take an enormous risk, if you think about it, at every meeting. Mm. Mm. It's, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's quite it's, frightening, because there are no givens. And so we tend to be rather independent, outspoken people, as you've probably gathered. Um, and when we have a meeting for worship for business, to give it its correct title, we are not trying to reach a decision. It's not a democracy. There's no vote. We are not trying, so that, again, coming back to what you said, if I know that I am right and that the wall should be blue because of all sorts of very good reasons, and Joyce is saying, well, no, actually, they should be red for all sorts of other reasons, it's not whether I'm right or Joyce is right. We are trying to establish not what we agree, but what is it that God requires of us? And what's best for this? What is what we, the way we are led yes. to find out what is best for the situation? Mm. Mm. So okay, so you're in that you're in that situation, and right. one person wants the walls to be yeah. blue, one person mm. wants the walls to be red. What what happens next? If it well, we try very hard to. The meetings are held in a spirit of love. We generally don't start arguing. We don't generally, it doesn't turn into a discussion. You know, you, you say what you've got to say and then that should be enough. The next person says what they've got to say. Am I right in saying that, you're not, that um, one of the rules is you're, you're not allowed to a repetition? You're allowed to. You're you're just allowed generally, to you just generally you don't. Discretion. No, and, we don't have rules in that well, sense. Yeah. But can I just say that if the thing appears to get a bit heated. I remember the very first business meeting I ever went to, and I'd read about this, and I I'd, I'd sort of took it with a bit of a pinch of salt. They were arguing, I don't know what it was about, and things did get quite heated. There were two absolutely opposite views on whatever it was. And the clerk said, which is a, a standard thing in our meetings, friends, let's have a period of silence. Mm. And everyone's silent, and I sat there and I thought, Logically, there's no way they can ever agree because they were diametrically opposite. And I couldn't think of the solution. And I sat there wondering what would happen. And all of a sudden, somebody stood up and produced a third way. And that was so obviously the way. Mm. So both parties probably had been right, probably still are for, for all I know. <laughs> but that wasn't what happened. Well, they contributed to the eventual but outcome. Yeah, it's yeah. the process. Yeah. It's we the process. <coughs> not the product. Yeah. Mm. And it's sometimes, I mean, we're talking about the colours of the wall. Now, well, on one level, that is that. extremely trivial. Yeah, on the other hand, what's yeah. important is that we listen to what we each have to say. That's the process. Yes. And I think it's the pro... In a sense, the result is that we have a good, spirit-led process. Mm. And what will come out of that is we, we trust the process so that what does come out of it expresses the yeah. sense and you, of the of deliberations. The mm. And yeah. you're ready to own it, and therefore and you can yes. own it. Yeah. I remember yeah. we used important. to have house meetings yeah. and and then on Monday I'd go into school and and have a staff meeting and <laughs> just be so taken with how different the process oh, was yeah. because mm. I mean political meetings mm. institution meetings people come in with with a, a fixed Set determined <laughs> intent yes. to get a particular yes. outcome yes. and that's antithetical to what Quakers yeah, Quaker. are doing in a business yeah. meeting we come open, open to be to led in whatever direction yeah. we're it's going to go indeed. and often you know, the conclusion is something totally unforeseen. Un yeah. Yeah. Yes. And sometimes, if we can't come to an agreement, mm. we, 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 what, what is the term that we use? We are not in agreement. In unity. Not We're not in unity, unity, and we leave it. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. then nothing... Nothing, we, leave, yeah. we don't yeah. make it, we leave it till another time. Right. Uh, uh, well, like, it took, yes. I mean, we... Yeah. I think it was the slavery issue. I mean, yes. It took one man, you know, the best part of half a century, century yeah. to persuade the rest of the Society of Friends that yeah. slavery was... John Wilman. 
John Woolman. John and he, for all that time, he was a solitary voice, and mm. the business yes. meeting went on oh, for yeah. years and years and yeah. years, yes. until people caught yes. up with him. But once the decision was made, as Joyce was saying, it was it's owned, owned by the whole yeah. group. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that in a that sense, is, is where theocracy and democracy mm. touch. Yeah. Yes. Mm. You yeah. own it. And as a very Quaker term, you mm. own it. And I think mm. the other thing is, when, when that is said, when, as it were, that answer comes through, the recognition is very strong, mm. and you will actually see friends sort of suddenly saying, "Oh yes, mm. Mm. Yeah. you know, mm. you recognise it," mm. and so mm. it's not something you do unwillingly. Mm. It, it just you just suddenly realise, yes, this is this is how it should be. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I hope people watching this won't think that Quakers spend all the time discussing <laughs> things as <laughs> banal as the colour of wool. No, we don't. <laughs> no. No. One thing that I love dearly about the Quakers is that they there is always a space to look forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, w one of the proudest, I don't know whether that's the right word to use, <laughs> but I've used it anyway, <laughs> uh, the things is that if you look back at the scientists that Quakers have given to the world, um, w one has the, the man who invented, from one end to the other, you have John Dalton, who was the, the founder of atomic theory, to Arthur Eddington, who was, basically the founder of astrophysics and we still have very much alive and kicking the the scientists who dis discovered or helped discover the the first thing in the universe that wasn't made of atoms the neutron star and i do believe and hope that the problems that are wrecking science just as much as religion i i i do feel there's enough space within the quaker society to to help solve that so now, this is, this is my particular passion. Mm. It, it, it's obviously not Alistair's, but that doesn't mean to say no, that we, we, don't re don't, yeah. we, we, we don't relate in a unity at a deeper mm. level. Mm. So, so do where words that, don't matter. Mm. Mm. Where so words mm. don't matter. Mm. I'm interested in knowing <clears throat> why you think the, the Quakers have produced such great scientists. I, I think because the very, the growth that happens when one steps off into the void of the of the uh, the silent meeting and all the risks that go with it and all your ego and fears and insecurities that are always at risk i think it it insensibly opens one's mind to greater opportunities and science is is very much uh, restricted by closed mindedness uh, as well. I think Quakerism has been described as practical mysticism, and I, I like the combination of the two. It's yeah, this openness, yeah. and it's this taking account of reality. It's mm. testing it out with, with reality. How is this? It's not true because the book says so. It's because mm. I have it's this I've known it's experientially. Experiment. Yeah, experimentally. This I knew experimentally. Mm. Yes. And then he went to the Bible for corroboration. Yes. Mm. It I wasn't the other way around. I wonder, by the way, just, just to get back just for a minute to the, mm. to the um, relationship between Christianity yes. and Quakerism. And also, I'm, I'm right in saying that it's still written within the code of conduct that um, you cannot swear an oath on the Bible, or, or can you do that now? No, we affirm. We don't. We, we, don't. Don't. we right. believe in a single standard of truth. Right. Mm. And that isn't contradictory to the Christian no. Which actually says in, in, says in, the, in the book of James that you shouldn't swear. Let it's actually in the Bible that you shouldn't. And your yeah. be nay. It's, un it's an unbiblical <laughs> thing to actually swear. This mm. is why the early, one of the reasons why the early Quakers actually um, tes uh, testified in this yeah. way. Mm. Right. But it's also a more, there's also a deeper issue of, of letting you yay your be own yay, integrity, nay be nay. depending on your own integrity. And, and this is where they were so, they were so um, successful in business because eventually people discovered that if they, if they traded with Quakers, they had a, a standard and they could trust them. Yeah, Barclays Bank and Lloyds Bank were yeah. results of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore, but that's <laughs> where that's so you could trust true. your money with these people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and this is, where, this is where it started. This was part of it. There was it's something I, I did want to get back to what Frank was saying about the, the, you know, the early Christians. Okay, and the were, they were Jews, of course, I mean, it's a matter of historical fact. But the thing that, that united them, the thing that they had that was central, they had, the ex, they had an, an experience of the resurrected Christ. Mm. And that's what made them Christians. And do, do Quakers today have that experience? Mm. That, and, I think, and I think that it, it, 
it's important. <laughs> and I don't think it's a matter of labels, no. because, you know, you, you either have it or, you, you know, or you don't. I just wanted to end by asking you a question, Lisa, uh, which is, um, apparently, that we, we put an advert in, in the paper looking for people to take part in this programme, and when you read the advert, um, you, you quaked. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I just I think so, so. Firstly, was it? Did you did you have to come on the program because of that? And secondly, um, I hope that we lift up to. <laughs> 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 Gosh, um, I didn't read the ad. Actually, it was my husband who said, "I think you should do that." Um, and I said something like, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it, you know, thinking that it would pro probably go away in the way that things generally do if you say you'll think about them. And he said, go on, do it now. And I became aware in the same way that I get when I give ministry that, to quote, I mean, Joyce said it, but to quote Martin Luther, I can, I can do no other. Uh, so I phoned up. Um, and it felt right, and I hope that it's lived up. Uh, I think that's probably not my decision. I mean, I've enjoyed it. I think it's been an amazing experience. Maybe enjoying it is, is living up to it enough. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.